it's Greg here. I'm going to be talking about Vim again, funnily enough. And uh, previously I'd been talking about settings, so I'm going to continue that. I'm going to see if I can get through the rest of this file today. Uh, I'm not going to look at every setting, but I'm going to stop on the ones that I've got something to say about. Um, so the first one we're going to look at is no join spaces. So let's turn join spaces on again. And that way I can demo what join spaces does. So with shift J, these joins are going to get li these lines are going to get joined together. And you'll notice that they have two spaces between each word after the period. I don't want that behavior. Um, so let's put it back the way it was. No join spaces. When I join with shift J now, I just get the single space, which is what I want. Next one, number. I believe I've probably talked about this in another screencast, uh, but I will at least note here that what's not obvious is that number and relative number can actually be turned on and off independently of one another. And I have them both turned on. So relative number gives me those nice numbers up and down from the current line. So I can jump up and down um, and get around. Uh, but it's also useful to see what the line number of the current line is. So that's what the set number does. And if I were to turn that off, then I would just get zero there, which is not super useful. But with number turned on as well as relative line number, I get the current line number, which is nice. Scroll off. So that keeps lines visible at the top and bottom of the screen. So if I go to the top with shift H or the bottom with shift L, you notice that it didn't go literally all the way to the very first or very last line in the window. Um, rather it kept, or at least tries to keep three lines visible. And that's true as I scroll down as well. Uh, it tries to keep visible, which is good because it gives you some context. Um, and there's a related one here, side scroll off, which I'm gonna demonstrate by making a nice narrow window. We'll turn wrapping off. So you'll notice that with side scroll off, it won't actually let the cursor get all the way to the side. It jumps when you're about three characters before the end or the beginning. So this one not as useful uh, because we tend not to edit text in such ridiculously narrow windows. But I think it's still nice to have somewhat consistent behavior between the vertical and the horizontal case. So I have side scroll off turned on as well. So let's have a look here. Um, shift, I'm gonna skip those ones. Short mess, love this one. I love this one because it's one of those things that you can go for years without knowing exists. And then when you discover it, you realize it solves some little problem that you have been annoyed by for a long time. And so what short mess does is it allows you to customize the messages that Vim displays at various times. Um, it can either turn them on, suppress them or change them. And so have a good look at the list of options here. There's a bunch of possible customizations that you can do. Um, but specifically, um, if we look at my short mess settings, I have a lot of them. Um, in addition to the defaults, these are some that I have in my settings file here. By far my favorite is this one, uh, Shift A, which suppresses the display of a warning when you open a file, which already has a swap file associated with it. So um, the reason why I don't want to see this message is because it's going to prompt me and say, what do you want to do? And the answer is always going to be the same. It's always going to be edit the file anyway. Um, and the reason why editing the file anyway is okay is because I'm not worried about two versions of Vim on the same computer editing the same file concurrently. And the reason why I'm not worried about that is through focus events, I can actually keep multiple instances of Vim in sync with the file and I don't really need to worry about conflicting changes. So I believe I probably talked about this in a screencast on the Terminus plugin, but I'm going to show you again what I mean by that just to demonstrate that in the context of this short mess stuff. So basically I've, I'm in my settings file here um, and I'm gonna change the file from outside of Vim. So I'm gonna put foo at the end here. It's gonna be, foo's now on the end of the file. When I move the cursor over to the Vim window and jump down the bottom, you'll see that foo appeared there without me having to explicitly do anything. So there are three things that enabled Vim to detect this change without any intervention on my part. Now, the first one is I'm using the Terminus plugin, which makes it so that the focus events get through to Vim, um, even though it's running in the terminal and even though it's running inside Tmux. Uh, the only dependency is having a terminal which is modern. And so I'm using iTerm, that's a modern terminal, it works. 
the second piece that you need is you need an auto command that's listening to those focus events. And if you've got that auto command, that enables you to run this check time command. And as the help says, what check time does is checks the file system to see if anything has changed since the buffer were loaded. And the third thing you need is something that does something in response to the check time result, and that's the auto read setting to the rescue, which will automatically read the file in if it has changed. So this effectively means that you aren't going to see the annoying swap file messages and you aren't going to get into an inconsistent state because your Vim is going to be consistent all the time anyway, uh, which is nice. Um, so let's keep going. Uh, we've got no splash screen. I generally like to turn off as many things as I can. And I've tried to make some messages um, more abbreviated or less verbose. Uh, show break, we've already seen in action. That is what's responsible for rendering this little character here where a line wraps. Show command, I'm going to skip. Smart tab, I'm going to skip. The comment says what it does. Uh, spell cap check, I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to, first thing I'm going to do is turn on spell checking. And normally I wouldn't have spell checking turned on in a code window. I'd have it turned on for something like a markdown document or a commit message. Um, but I'm going to do it. I want to do a demo here. So let's make a comment with a word that doesn't exist. Synergize the things to synergize them. So we have a couple of spelling errors here. Without this spell cap check setting, I would need to add both of these words to the custom dictionary in order for Vim to recognize them as valid. But with this, I'm telling Vim that the case of the first letter shouldn't matter. So if I hit ZG here, you notice that both of them got un-underlined, which means they were both handled in the custom dictionary. Um, if I use ZW to mark them as bad words, then they both get underlined again. Um, one little interesting thing about that is if I were to add a word with case in it to the dictionary with ZG, only that word is going to get added to the dictionary. You notice that synergize in lowercase actually stayed where it was. Um, so it's kind of like smart case for search. So I'm going to get capital synergize out of my dictionary again. and I'm going to turn spelling off. That makes it pretty useful because you don't have to have all these double entries in your dictionary um, as a result of that setting. Split below and split right control where the cursor and where the focus is going to be when you do a split. Um, it's fairly obvious what split below does. Basically, when you create a split, you're going to wind up with the focus below. Um, and likewise, when you do split right, the focus is going to be on the right. Um, I don't know if there's any objective reason for preferring those, but I do prefer them. And so I have them set like that. Um, switch buff is subtle but useful. Basically, uh, normally when you run switch buff, it's going to try to switch to a, a buffer containing the file that you want, want to edit but it won't look in other tabs. Um, what use tab does is says, look in other tabs as well. And if you've got it open already, use that. Um, so I use that in command T, for example, uh, where I might just say, I'm gonna open another file in here. Like I'm gonna open the readme in another tab. Um, and then just say, I wanna go to readme again by command T. Without switch buff manipulation, it would actually open this file again here, but with switch buff, use tab, it actually just went to the tab. Um, and so briefly how to set that up. Um, this is not the default behavior in command T because I'm very conservative in terms of how I change the behavior. Um, so it behaves pretty much like it did when it first came out. Um, but it is possible to supply, uh, as you can see here, a custom function that should be called when or a, a custom command that should be called to accept a, a, a file. Um, and so I've actually provided this, this command and with it this function here that basically uses switch buff under the covers to switch to the buffer if the buffer already exists. Um, so switch buff, another kind of hidden gem that I didn't know about for many years. Uh, term GUI colors is something that was added in the lead up to Vim 8. Basically, if you've got a modern terminal like iTerm, then you can use full 24-bit color in your color schemes. Um, this one's subtle. Uh, it worked pretty well even without it, but I have noticed that since switching to this, things like my reds are redder, and it just looks closer to how it looks in, in MacVim, which is nice. Uh, 
I'm going to skip over this persistent undo and vim info stuff uh, because I already looked at those in previous episodes. Uh, virtual edit I can demonstrate. Basically this allows the cursor to move in columns where there is no text. So for example line 168 where I am right now, that's actually a zero width column and without virtual edit block I wouldn't be able to move there. Whoops, I have no idea what I just did then. I accidentally went into a fold. Um, so this is nice uh, because it enables unconstrained movement um, and it also enables you to do crazy stuff like, you know, paint stars where there shouldn't be stars. Uh, which wrap related closely to the backspace setting, which I talked about previously about how far you can backspace in insert mode. Uh, this is similar in that it's like what keys should be allowed to cross line boundaries um, and uh, Again, like the list there, HL, uh, left and right, it's pretty useful, I think, to have those cross line boundaries. Although if you're just mashing the H and L key, it's probably a bad sign. Um, I think it's okay if you're doing it as like a nervous twitch, but it shouldn't be your default method of like moving large distances. Nevertheless, it's good to remove that friction there when you hit a line boundary. Um, and these others, I don't think there's anything worth commenting on there. So that brings me to the end of this true of the settings file. So. Uh, Thanks for going through that process with me. And if you discover any settings that I don't know about, comment on my video and let me know because I always love finding these things and I'm not patient enough to read through like 20,000 lines of Vim help documentation to find out about everything. Um, so thanks for watching and I'll be back again soon with some more content for you.